Hi, I'm Earl Taylor, Chief Knowledge Officer at the Marketing Science Institute. As many of you know, MSI helps marketers become better marketers. Our business and academic thought leaders collaborate to create new marketing knowledge, which we share in a variety of ways. And one of the most popular is our online lecture series. Those of you attending today represent many business sectors such as healthcare, CPG, research, and transportation, as well as MSI members such as Colgate, Facebook, Kantar, Kaiser Permanente, and others. We're delighted to welcome you to learn more about mass disruption. Now, before we begin, I'd like to point out the chat with presenter function in the left-hand corner of your screen. Please use this feature to send through any questions you have during the presentation. We'll have, uh, gather the questions and have a brief Q&A session following the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. Stan Houston is digital brand building veteran at the Procter & Gamble Company, bringing together digital, technology, and marketing expertise since the early 2000s. Over the last decade, uh, he has led digital innovation and strategic partnerships, such as with Google and Facebook, on behalf of P&G's Chief Brand Officer, Mark Pritchard. Today, Sam will provide a glimpse of how the largest marketer in the world is reinventing brand building. So again, Sam, we're great to have you today to help us understand about leading mass disruption. Earl, thank you very much for the very kind introduction, and uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody on the phone. So um, thank you for inviting me back to do a replay of what was previously presented at the trustees meeting in November. Um, a quick word about myself. Um, you already heard the work that I do at PNG. Um, my key focus has been on innovation, and large partnerships play a role in there. And to just give you a little bit of a personal flavor of what, um, what motivates me, um, I like this uh, saying from uh, General Sinseki, who has been in the U.S. Army um, and I think is retired right now. But uh, you know, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. I, I think that digital has been prodding a lot of these thoughts. Um, it's been hard to get everybody on board in digital to understand it, uh, but it is a change that is uh, determining how our world evolves, and uh, we are intent to lead that at PNG. And one of the aspects that is being reinvented is mass marketing, and. Um, Many of the things uh, what we want to do in there is to lead the disruption that is uh, taking place, uh, especially to help us enable sales and share growth uh, while driving out waste to save and then reinvest that money. So we know that traditional print and television continues its steady decline. Seven out of 10 people also say that ads uh, are annoying. In the meantime, Digital media is ever increasing and dominant, especially when it comes to mobile devices, which are increasingly the best uh, the way that people connect. Over 30% of the people actually on these devices ha use ad blockers to avoid, uh, to avoid ads, and it's growing in, in, uh, rapidly. And many people actually cut the cord completely with over-the-top viewing where there are no ads at all, and it's all subscription-based. Digital marketing really started out with big promises that everything is now measurable, so we could drive more effectiveness and efficiency. But digital really yet, has yet to deliver on that promise. We learned that the John Wanamaker saying from the 1800s um, still applies. You know, half the money is really wasted, and we don't know where it goes exactly. So this is part of the objective that we are working on. The other part that has changed is that um, we are now living in a world full of e-commerce, and this is also disrupting how PNG uh, uh, operates. Uh, we, it no longer is it only brick and mortar stores where we sell our wares. Um, there's there's many others that um, sorry go back to the slide. Um, there are many others that are now entering the market, especially what we are starting to notice, and you may have read many stories about that direct-to-consumer startups that are growing users with one-to-one -one engagement, direct, uh, direct connections, and bypassing many or most, if not all, media net networks. So what really has changed? Well, the world is now truly digital. More people in the world have mobile phones than actually their toilets. 
4 billion people are now connected to the internet. And this has led to a tremendous change in how people behave in all aspects of their life. Um, when it comes to commerce, people everywhere have now incredible expectation when it comes to choice, speed, and convenience. Many of you, if not all, even all of you on the phone, are, for example, uh, members of Amazon Prime. Now it's uh, everybody's expectation that anything could be shipped from anywhere in the U.S. within two days, and people who can't do that, companies that can't do that, are often missing the expectations of their consumers. Digital has also changed the ecosystem for innovation. Now, with easy access to digital Lego blocks, anyone can create a business today for a fraction of the investment it took even 10 years ago. And this truly has created a flywheel. Lower cost of setting up a business means more startups. More startups means more successes. And more successes means more investment from, uh, for example, venture capital. And more investment means more entrepreneurs are attracted to the space, and more entrepreneurs means even more tools for innovation get created. In the meantime, companies like P&G continue to use proven processes for innovation, except that the proven part is based on a world that no longer really exists. We have a, 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 a what you could say is we have a, a, a costly installed base of processes that no longer are at this age. For us to avoid irrelevance, we need to change. In fact, we need to lead the mass disruption that is taking place. And especially, we need to lead in brand building, from wasteful mass marketing to mass one-to-one -one building, uh, building, uh, brand building fueled by data and technology. So we call as a first step, we called for digital media transparency, uh, Mark Pritchard did, about two years ago now. It turned out that what we thought was a perfect world that is measurable actually had a large underbelly where a lot of data didn't, uh, wasn't really what it appeared to be. And so we wanted to provide, you know, get to transparent performance data on things like viewability, audience reach, frequency, agency contracts, bot fraud, brand safety, and that work is now about 90% complete. It also exposed substantial waste, not necessarily fraudulent, but just waste. We reduced that waste, uh, waste for digital spend by as much as 50% with some of the big players, then to reinvest into better performing media, such as data-driven programmatic media and higher TV reach. We gathered consumer data on our own platforms, our web platforms and other platforms, of course in a very privacy, GDPR compliant way for those who are familiar with the European legislation. And that's made possible because our brands touch over 5 billion people every day. Our data management platforms now have over 1 billion consumer IDs worldwide. We accelerated performance analytics and we hired our own data scientists to help reduce our overall media waste by about 20% overall, uh, while increasing our reach at the same time by about 10%. These are numbers that are from somewhere mid last year that we could have, and this path continues. So what we did here, there are three actions that we try to lead um, to, uh, we are trying to take to uh, reinvent and, and lead disruption in, in mass marketing. The first one is we're reinventing media. We want to go from the wasteful mass blasting to mass reach with one-to-one -one precision. We, it, it is a fact that a company like P&G with mass brands such as Tide and Crest and Pampers still needs to reach many people because billions of people use our brands every day to clean their clothes, brush their teeth, and wash their hair. The data and analytics facilitates a much greater precision to remove the waste and increase the effectiveness. The second action that we're taking is reinventing advertising from mass clutter with too many ads to less doing more. In the US, we have a data management platform that covers 90% of our households with anonymous audience data. 
which we then combine with purchase data into Data and Analytics Learning Lab. We're moving from generic demographic targets like women ages 18 to 49 to more than 350 precise smart audiences like first-time moms or millennial young professionals and first-time washing machine owners. That helps us reach the right people at the right time and, and the right place and results in significantly more sales at lower media cost. The third action that we are taking is reinventing agency partnerships from outsourcing too much work to getting our hands on the keyboard. Over time, marketers have delegated so much of their work to agencies, resulting in too many touch points between brand managers and consumers and too much project management. We really want fewer project managers and more brand entrepreneurs much closer to the consumer. This means discerning what work is done by PNG versus agencies. A couple of examples in here is like when we talk about um, data-driven performance marketing, it takes into account all kinds of data that you see in here uh, that we can capture from most of our systems all by ourselves. First-party data and then data strategy is absolutely critical in this uh, in this setup. So here's a just a quick glance of what it means that we have data that can help reach, uh, you know, smart audiences. Smart audiences actually can help us also, uh, you know, it's in many cases it's called lookalike models on platforms so as, such as Google and Facebook. We can actually do that ourselves as well. So, for example, when we have, um, you know, households that are buying Tide from loyalty card data that we uh, uh, obtain in a privacy safe way, we can enrich it with additional data, and then we actually can identify the lookalikes, which dramatically expands the precision audiences that we originally found, um, and has proven uh, increase in effectiveness and efficiency. One of the things to, um, well, one, one more note on this one. Um, the data analytics that is, um, is also enabling us to bring more media planning in-house, which we're actually doing in China in about four categories and expanding in the U.S. We're doing more media deals in-house in multiple countries and negotiating, negotiating directly with media providers. I like a startup, we're starting to buy more search and social media in-house. One of the key aspects that has also changed is that we are creating digital experiences. Those are one-to-one -one digital engagements uh, where we can actually have direct interactions with consumers. I already pointed out that our first party data is absolutely essential um, raw material for this process. And the more that uh, our uh, product propositions or our consumer experiences have digital interactions, the more refined our data can get and the more precise we can be in how we do our targeting and, and how we communicate with our consumers. One of the examples here is what we have called uh, Ole Skin Advisor, which uh, is an artificial intelligence powered system that was fueled by uh, Neurologix, which is a startup out of uh, Boston, a spin out of MIT. And it actually enables you to take a selfie from which you then can diagnose your skin, and then it asks you a few questions. And at the end, it comes out with what's called a skin age versus your actual age. That will apply, you know, probably have a poor effect on me and, and scare me. Um, but with this goes a recommendation of product regimen and also expert advice that we can provide instantly through email uh, also with the help of a company called Retention Science, it's another startup partner. The, the one thing is that this algorithm gets smarter with every selfie that people shoot. And it's not an ad at all. It's actually a very useful engagement for consumers with our products as a product experience and helps them solve one of the biggest challenges that we see in this category, which is which product is right for me. One of the um, elements that is powering um, PNG's innovation drive is actually we're organizing around what is called Lean Startup Innovation. Many of you may have heard of the book uh, Lean Startup, as was written by Eric Ries. 
Um, he has a couple of other ones out. Uh, there's, another, there's some others that are similar to this. But we are organizing around that. We have various entities inside of PNG that are actually helping our brand teams practice this uh, to address strategic business uh, opportunity areas and business needs that we can, that we can resolve uh, in a, a rapid iteration fashion. Um, we have uh, a program called Signal Accelerator where we bring in outside startups. Uh, our Shark Tank uh, team is actually focused on product supply innovation. We have an entity called PNG Ventures where we uh, try we do innovative work outside of the standard categories, and uh, we have a lean startup approach that are across the categories uh, that we call GrowthWorks. And many of these are now leading to very interesting case studies and truly are a jumping off point for what we would call brand entrepreneurs, people who have end-to-end -end responsibility of the initiatives that they're leading, uh, usually surrounded by small multifunctional teams that help uh, to bring new ideas uh, to life very, very quickly. And this is also an intent of how we try to bring a mass disruption to, to brand building because these brand entrepreneurs actually are practicing many of the things that the startups are already doing, but with the resources of PNG behind it. Here are a couple of examples that you can uh, consider uh, that we are currently bringing to market here. One of them is um, we tested out in Chicago um, a um, laundry cleaning service. Um, one of the insights was that a significant part of the laundry is actually not done in, uh, by people themselves in their own house, but actually done uh, through laundromats or other services that are set up. So we crafted a, you know, a small team inside of PNG and Fabric Care crafted the proposition that they were able to bring to market very quickly uh, with lots of decision power um, that they then brought into uh, the market, uh, tested it out, uh, tried various hypotheses, and then uh, modified that proposition, went on, and then it ultimately came out as a proposition called Tide Spin. This was so interesting that we actually found a company that we are now partnering with that we acquired called Pressbox that we have now integrated with that also provides dry cleaning with the laundry service as well. So this means that we are starting to make a step into uh, service areas more than what we have done before as well. Another area of innovation which we would traditionally, you know, somewhat surprising for people is toilet paper. There's a small team in our um, family care division that is actually um, you know, single-mindedly uh, focused on helping to solve one problem, that is for people to never run out of toilet paper. There's a couple of ideas that they have, one of which is, what if we had a really massive amount of toilet paper on one roll? And it may seem like a crazy idea. However, they started to test it out, and they said, well, why don't we make a few, and why don't we sell a few? In, uh, in small test markets with direct-to-consumer uh, websites um, where they were able to, to test pricing, test all the convenience. There's some incredible war stories behind that because there's no stand for toilet paper that is big enough to actually, you know, most American bathrooms to actually put the toilet paper on. So we provide them as part of the initial kit that people get. So uh, the team, consisting of two people and actually $10,000 to bring this to market, then ordered a set of stands from AliExpress out of China to include in this. And uh, this test is now quite successful and we are expanding this proposition uh, beyond the small initial test market uh, based on the many learnings that this team uh, gained uh, in running this one year. Another area that is of interest to us is naturals. Um, and I assume that that goes for many of the companies that are involved uh, in today's calls as well. So one group in um, our fabric care division actually uh, created a test product that's called Nine Elements that's currently for sale. Uh, you can go to the website, and it literally does this like you know nine elements or less in a uh, in a product with a, you know proven efficacy, but also a story behind the incredible um, the elements, uh, all the ingredients, why they are uh, working, what they do. 
um, which is an area that's quite new. Normally, such a trajectory would cost us several years to develop. This one, again, was brought to market from idea to uh, being in market within uh, 12 months, which is an incredible speed for a company like P&G, um, where we normally have very long and established pipelines of products that we go through. Another example, which is actually very amazing, um, is uh, Pampers in the Naturals area. This actually was an, a, 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 an insight from one of our product researchers who had a baby herself who was um, who, fall, uh, who uh, falls exactly in the, the, the group of people who is attracted to this product. And she found it hard to believe that P&G didn't have a proposition, proposition for uh, people who are inclined to buy natural products. Um, and so, you know, the best way to do it is to go tackle this yourself. And so she did, with full permission from leadership, uh, assembled a team, they did all the work, and again, within a, a very per short period of time and after several iterations of testing, they were able to bring Pampers uh, Pure to market, which is now uh, one of the shining lights of the Pampers brands, especially in the U.S. Another area where there's a lot of work going on is actually in our shave care division. Um, as you uh, may have heard, this, uh, our grooming uh, division is probably the one that has been most directly affected by some of the uh, direct-to-consumer brands, uh, such as uh, Harry's and Dollar Shave Club. They're not sitting idle. They're trying to create uh, new propositions for consumers that makes them stand out from the crowd. One of the things that we did was a, uh, an idea that uh, was actually based on an R&D small exercise they tested in the middle of London one time. What if we create 3D printed handles? And they tested this out just that out of a you know, sheer interest of experimentation, and that worked very well. Now, you can do that on a small pop-up uh, store size scale, but then how do you do this and how do you bring this to market on a larger scale is uh, quite a challenge. So um, we worked with uh, the Gillette brand, and what we now have in market is the Gillette Razor Maker, where everybody can go online and actually create or select from an existing set uh, a 3D handle that perfectly fits with Gillette and that can be ordered there. Um, we have high hopes for this. It's, it's probably not going to be a, you know, a massive um, uh, you know, contributor to, to Gillette sales, but it, is, it stands out as, as something that we can do to further build connections with our consumers and loyalty. One of the things that we have also done is help build uh, and strengthen capabilities within PMT. As part of our innovation program called Signal, we created last summer a signal challenge exercise. One of the things that we are learning about is what's called performance marketing, which traditionally doesn't apply much to, P to companies the size of P&G, which is tracing your marketing through to actual sales signals and then um, getting a, a almost real-time feedback loop to further optimize your campaign. With most of our sales not, uh, you know, not managed by ourselves, that is usually very hard to do. However, in this space, this is an area that we need to master. If you want to sell something online, you also need to make sure that you, you get all the data and data analytics. Now, normally what we would do is we would go in and uh, the, we have our capability teams that would get presentations, maybe a little bit of training, and then te teams go off. So that would be an afternoon where people get together. And that is just a very difficult way to learn. Um, it usually... Um, the, the expectations of the actions that it drives aren't always met. So we turned this a, a bit around and we, we invited, we made this a competition. Uh, we invited uh, 10 to 12 teams in for a period of uh, eight to 12 weeks. And uh, we gave them some tools at the beginning, a little bit of money uh, with some help from uh, the various platforms uh, for advertising uh, and we let them go. They were able to place media uh, hands-on without a media agency. They were able to put whatever creative they thought would work for them within legal boundaries, of course. And they had full decision power to iterate day on day uh, to, um, to get the most out of their dollars and to adjust landing sites, uh, to optimize the product pages that they go to. And it, it was a phenomenal experience that really created a mindset shift for many of the people of how they would look at brand building overall. And this is not just relevant for 
people who are going to do direct-to-consumer marketing with their own website. This also carries through to larger efforts that are being done. When people get this, this deep in with hands on keyboard and, and, and understanding what it means to place search ads or display ads or Facebook ads, uh, these people are also asking the agencies involved in their normal work different questions and more precise questions than they would do before that. They also start to think a little bit about their brand building efforts a little bit more nuanced than um, it is a set it and forget it approach where we, we put our plan together, it take a long time to get that together, and then we months later we see what came out of that execution. We now have many more signals that we can see in flight and opportunities to adjust, which also come back to the performance marketing principles. So this is a quick glimpse of what is going on at P&G and why we're, um, how we're taking on um, leading uh, mass disruption, especially in brand building. Uh, we are just at the beginning of the work. Uh, as a famous Facebook poster always said, we're only 1% done. Um, there's a lot of work ahead of us. But I wanted to share this with you as uh, this is a very interesting time to be um, in, uh, in brand building, advertising, marketing, um, especially for those people who have a knack for digital. Uh, there is a rich uh, ground to plow ahead of us that we can work on and it, uh, what brand building will look like in the next few years will look uh, quite different from what we used to what we used to know. Well, thanks very much, Stan. That's that's great, and I really appreciate uh, your running through that and giving us some time for Q and A here at the end. So I want to remind the audience again that you can post your questions at the direct, directly at the chat with presenter function in the left hand corner of the screen, uh, and we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, First of all, I want to uh, raise an issue that's sort of a general question. Um, it's one thing for a Procter & Gamble, as well known as you are and your brands are, so many of the iconic brands that you gave examples of, to uh, go digital to begin operating in, in the online space. And it probably uh, builds on a lot of, uh, you know, literally a, a century of brand building and awareness and familiarity with the brands. Do you think some of these same principles are equally applicable to a smaller startup company that may not have the sort of brand or name recognition that P&G and your products do? Would you, would you temper your advice in any way for a company that's starting out as compared to a legacy company like P&G? No, I, I, I believe that, that brands and brand building are equally important for small companies as they are for larger ones. Um, maybe the way to go about it is a bit different. Um, uh, for example, one of the things that we have found consistently is brands, uh, startup brands that are good storytellers leave a lasting impact. Um, I, I even go back to, to Casper, who brought that back, um, the, the origin of where it came from, the unpacking experience. Um, it all added to the, the equity of what Casper was. It was a new and unique way to buy mattresses uh, not through a mattress store where they would, you know, be commission based. Uh, this was more, you know, convenient for you. The fact that they could deliver mattresses to your door, which is normally you're associated with a big truck, this was much better. So brand building in this space and storytelling that goes along with it remains crucial. It's actually, I believe, one of the benefits that we have known in this space. Uh, because many of the startups are now struggling with what's their brand story, right? Selling products isn't just enough. It has to stand for more than that. Okay, that's, that's a good point, actually. Um, I think maybe a related concept, too, is uh, you mentioned the kind of brand entrepreneurs, and, and you were saying towards the end of your presentation, some of the advantages and benefits to P&G are just the sort of more hands-on mindset that, that the brand marketers develop by being more engaged in the digital campaigns, working with the agencies. But isn't there a danger um, of cannibalization of some of your existing products? I mean, how does P&G sort of weigh that and, and maybe empower or reward brand entrepreneurs to do something that may actually challenge some of your existing uh, brands or the franchise? Yeah, well, well, of course there is, right? Um, and one thing to remember is that brand management was actually introduced at P&G to kind of create the competition because it's better to disrupt yourself than and to take share from yourself as a company than let others do it. 
Um, and I think the innovation uh, drive also keeps everybody sharp in this one. Now, there is, of course, a, a portfolio strategy and a category on this one. Uh, but it is much better for a company to, um, to add to their port, you know, to, to extend their portfolio to keep the market share or even grow the market share uh, than letting others do that to you. Um, it needs to be done with some balance. I, I, I agree with that one. Um, but um, for me, it's a, it's a fairly simple choice. Okay, great. One of the questions that came in just now is whether the presentation will be available later, and I just wanted to let the audience know that, yes, in fact, this will be recorded, is being recorded, and will be posted on our website shortly after the live event today for those of you who want to go back through the presentation. Uh, Max had a couple of related questions. One is uh, a company like P&G, the, the legacy that you have, you probably have quite a lot of product ideas sort of on the shelf from previous uh, patents or, or developments. And are you going back, you might say, kind of your, to your back list to uh, launch products that maybe have been tried in the past but without this sort of uh, digital uh, support and engagement you described? And I think a related question to that is, uh, are you allowing your brand entrepreneurs and people to really uh, pilot and activate these brands outside of P&G, maybe setting up you know, smaller uh, companies or something to sort of be more of a, an incubator away from the corporate parent? Yeah, let me take it uh, one at a time. Um, let me start with the last one because it's fresh. Um, we okay. are testing all kinds of innovation uh, models uh, in, in this scope. Um, we don't, there isn't a one-size-fits-all here. Um, so we have a whole breadth of programs, uh, in, including what we would call external incubation, where uh, we actually collect some people around ideas, uh, and they may be external people, to bring them to market. Um, to, uh, you know, inside of P&G, but yet further removed from the business. For example, the person who is leading the nine elements uh, effort sits in Seattle with a small team, um, which just happened to be a location where he was. Um, it, it's a little bit, uh, you know, um, uh, across the horizon from Cincinnati, so not fully supervised as it would normally take place. Um, the, 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 um, the press box one actually happened in Chicago and was uh, actually housed for a while in uh, a, a regional incubator that was in Chicago, including some of the connections and help. Um, so there's all kinds of models to do it. Um, I, I think there are some principles behind it that we are learning quite rapidly, um, that innovation does, does need focused attention from the team that's working on it. It cannot be a part-time job, which we have consistently seen as a key reason that some initiatives fail. Okay, and the uh, first part of the question, it was kind of a lot to throw at you, sorry, yeah. was uh, uh, whether or not P&G, you know, uh, presumably has quite a lot of product ideas that for one reason or another weren't brought to yes. market or maybe not successfully in the past and how that may yeah. have changed with your new t digital capabilities. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that a lot has changed. Um, this is a little bit beyond my uh, purview here, but um, yes, uh, patents are definitely assets and sometimes we monetize them through our uh, global business development team to license them out to others if we don't see any value for it. But I, you know, it is my full assumption that the R&D organization quite well knows what they're sitting on and when there is renewed relevance for some of the work that's already done. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of timing in all innovation, right? Um, so yes, I, I think there is definitely uh, an effort to make sure that we get optimal value from the uh, proprietary knowledge and, and, and patents that we have. Uh, one thing to say in this space is that um, most of our patents, of course, um, are related to, uh, I would say, chemical engineering and product engineering, although there's quite a domain outside of that too. But in essence, P&G still is, uh, at its core in R&D, a chemical engineering company. I think what, what is starting to change as well is that there is a growing amount of digital competency that's being built also on the product development side. And I would actually you know, um, say it's more than product development, it's experience development, an integrated product. For example, uh, something like the Skin Advisor has to be an integral part of the product offering that you give to uh, your consumers because it helps make their lives a little easier to find the right product for them. Uh, and maybe even 
build some information into it of how to best use product, which also is often uh, a, a, a key barrier uh, that we have seen with consumers. I, that's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up again because I, I wanted to follow up a couple of questions related to this shift from the product to the, uh, as you call it, maybe the experience, uh, more of a service orientation, certainly the, the laundry and, and dry cleaning business, although it's a natural extension of P&G's historic role. Uh, but Arvind had a question, <clears throat> I think it's important, pardon me, that if the skin advisor essentially recommends um, P&G or Olay uh, products uh, pretty much exclusively, uh, is there an issue around credibility? Are, are people, are consumers going to believe that maybe the, you're giving them the best choice that P&G offers them, but maybe not necessarily the optimum? Or how do you sort of balance that issue of the, the advisor being a trusted source of information when it's also obviously promoting P&G products? Yeah, my, my personal perspective on this one is that the first and foremost priority for us in this one was to resolve a barrier that we saw with people wanting to buy Olay products, which is um, I, I believe at the count that I heard at the time that it went in, we had about 140 SKUs uh, that were offered in shelves. When you walk into uh, a CVS or a Walgreens or a Target and you look at the Olay shelf, it, it's confusing, especially for males like me. I wouldn't know where to start. Um, not that I buy a lot of Olay, but I, I would think if it's, uh, for, for women that's the case as well. So the, the key thing that we wanted to solve for was a pain point of our Olay consumer, existing Olay consumers are, uh, to find the right product for, for them, right? And it seemed at that point in time that there were all kinds of product recommendation uh, opportunities, even inside of P&G. The digital road was littered of examples that just didn't, uh, weren't sustainable. Many of them I found were actually based on Excel spreadsheets with very static if-then-l structures. And if uh, some new information came in on what applied to the choices or new SKUs came in, it was a dramatic amount of work to optimize. Um, this setup uh, with the AI engine that went in it has proven to be much more effective and actually results in a large number of very personalized recommendations. You know, the joke inside was always with an Excel spreadsheet. Oh, you always end up with this product, right? It's like it's fixed. It's like you get asked these questions, but there's one answer that comes out. In this case, that's absolutely not the case. And what we have gone back is like, are people more happy with the recommendations, the use of the recommended product as they come out than what they did before? And for us, the lesson was absolutely. And that was what we solved for. So, um, yeah, it would be great if somebody else can offer this on a more neutral way um, outside of P&G products alone. I'll leave that to others who are in that business. Um, I think it would hit P&G credibility a, a bit as well uh, when we would try to do that across all kinds of other variations of other products because people would say, yeah, that's a P&G recommendation engine. Of course they would recommend P&G, right? So um, it depends on what you want to solve for, right? I, I think within the LA consumer group or prospective LA consumer group, this was a highly credible app uh, that was very useful for the purpose it intended to serve. I think I think that's a great question, uh, a great answer to the question, and uh, it raises a, a real, maybe a related point, which is, um, and you touched on this, I think, when you uh, alluded to the quick you know, the quick time to market for some of these new uh, ways to, to launch products. Uh, historically, you would have run a test market and maybe seeing what the product you know, uh, response was in the actual marketplace and then extrapolate from that to the, the wider market if you decided to launch the product. It seems like now you're sort of short-circuiting the process that uh, effectively consumers could go to the website and, and order the product directly from P&G, or are you still primarily trying to sort of uh, expose consumers, make them aware that this product exists with the expectation that they're going to go find it on the store shelves, you know, so back to that solving for the complexity. It tells P&G which of its products are probably appealing most to consumers. Historically, that would have meant getting those on the store shelf, but are, it's kind of the balance between direct-to-consumer website purchases versus using this as kind of a research tool to do the test market and then provide the product through the typical channels of uh, brick-and-mortar stores. What, what's the balance yeah, there? That, that's, that's correct. I, I, well, it depends on the objective at hand, and I think DTC is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. Um, there's, there's various opportunities to use DTC, and I think you know, re replacing or, you know, a new instance of test marketing uh, or test markets would, is very useful for it. And that is what 
we use it for the <clears throat> innovation side of things. Uh, one of my sayings is in this one is that I think every brand or brand, uh, you know, uh, line extension that will be born from now on should be or uh, uh, born DTC, right? Um, the, the level of understanding that you can get from rapid iteration uh, through digital means is highly beneficial. And I, I recommend uh, to everyone on the phone is to take Eric Reese's book and, and, and read the Lean Startup um, because uh, usually with product development, you go in with a number of assumptions, and if you don't get to test them quickly, you may be totally wrong and invest large amounts of money behind it um, that could have been avoided if you just had uh, some early you know, product to sell or prototype to test, even if it wasn't totally realized yet. Now, the, the other part of DTC is uh, what, what we have learned is we have something called PG Shop uh, online. And what we are also seeing with that one is that um, either um, residual products from products that we no longer carry in uh, our, our main st in, with main customers, uh, it's a good point to find. Uh, products that are just a bit more rare um, that we have, but you can't buy it everywhere, uh, making that accessible, right? Um, there's just more precision available for that one. The largest reason that I think that DTC is very powerful is that it allows you to get direct consumer data. If you set this up well, uh, you have various means to, to get to know a lot more about your consumer um, that could be very helpful, not just for DTC efforts, but also for uh, larger um, uh, uh, brand building efforts. I think that last point's a good point because it would relate to probably a lot of the folks in the audience. Their businesses may never go direct to consumer or primarily that market. Yeah. Uh, and even today, I think you, you probably know the numbers, but it's a relatively small percentage of CPG goods, at least now, that are being purchased directly by consumers. Still, the vast majority of business is brick and mortar. But as you say, the insights from these digital efforts really can inform your brick and mortar uh, distribution strategy as yeah. well. Um, Siva Ramakrishnan, if I have that right, uh, asked a question earlier about whether or not the implications of some of what you shared mean that the traditional awareness trial repeat purchase model of CPG product launches, uh, is that broadly still applicable or do you see that that sort of, it's a little bit like questions about the so-called decision funnel, which really probably never was a funnel and certainly isn't today. But do the traditional um, ways of thinking about CP product launches still apply? It's just new technologies, or do you think digital fundamentally changes that? Well, the way that I explain it, of what I have learned of PNG and traditional product launches is go big or go home, right? Um, and it, you know, you need to have, you need to achieve a minimal amount of distribution for a product launch. Your your um, your factories needed to be fully ready for this. Um, and yes, you did te test markets, uh, but you had huge product launches with lots at stake. Um, and what that causes is a lot of tension. You, you know, you need to reduce risks, and therefore the planning period just gets extended. Like it, it would be normal to have a two-year two or three-year timeline to get to a launch, right? Um, I think digital makes that much more fluid and gradual. Um, you can test out more ideas. You should also have the capability to kill a lot of ideas. Um, and then they, they hopefully will, will grow up from there. Um, that is the, I, I think the, uh, the overall vision behind using things like DTC and performance marketing that you can gradually step it up. And that's a standard st a startup approach as well. I mean, they don't go home, you know, go big or go home. You know, several have tried in the past, especially in the first dot-com bubble, and uh, most of that fails. So I think that's part of the agility that uh, that you need to bring to the table from a from an innovation perspective. Is and there's nothing better than bringing something to market that may not be totally perfect yet, but real people pay real money for, for which you get real reactions. That's great, and, and I'm sure a lot of the folks in the audience know that the origins of that sort of uh, beta launch, beta test, you know, is in the uh, the technology and software industry uh, has really proven that model effective. And, and as you say, it sort of builds the constituency for the product, you know, with the consumer input, co-creation is sometimes called. Um, Arvind had an interesting question, too, going back to your, uh, the impact on employees of this new approach and, and the engagement that the brand 
managers have with working with the agencies and thinking about the product launch and so forth. Do you feel like this is having an impact on uh, employee uh, engagement, uh, loyalty, retention within P&G? Are you seeing sort of that secondary benefit of, of having the, more of this hands-on approach? Yeah, I, I definitely. Um, although it's very early in the process, and, and what I can speak to is like the, the signal challenge setup that we ran, which was this um, th this competition. Um, I, I've had various remarks from people who participated that this literally changed their lives, at least at PNG, um, because um, many of them commented on that they felt like. Uh, for the first time, they were able to make decisions, execute them, and see the results in a fairly limited amount of time um, that they were given a lot more freedom to operate in um, instead of the traditional approaches where, as I said, the big bang launches that we see, um, decisions usually get elevated one or two levels up at least. Um, the timelines in which it runs, people come and go. Uh, sometimes people don't see their work even go to, um, to launch. Uh, because they're on to their next assignment and leave it to somebody else. Um, I, what I have seen, the hands-on approach to do things, it's, it's inherent in lots of people, and, and uh, that's what they want in their job, and it gives them more satisfaction. I think it also gives them permission to unleash more creativity in the sense of they start thinking through what if instead of sticking to proven, in quotes, scenarios or uh, processes of how to do things, where there's very little room for um, uh, for thinking outside of that, uh, because you know that's the, how the machine has always worked, right? Um, so yes, I definitely think that uh, from the the um, from the experience I have with people who've stepped into this space, and it's still early days, um, there is a lot more energy and, and enthusiasm that this creates for their um, for their role as brand brand entrepreneur, right, the brand manager. I want to come back to something you shared at the very beginning, and I think it relates to a couple of questions, and that is this notion of the 350, I think you call them smart audiences, and they seem to be behaviorally defined, pretty specific, I think, like I said, first time washing machine owners or whatever. A um, couple of thoughts. Uh, is that different, and if so, how from sort of traditional segmentation, which of course has been a technique you know, for decades in, in marketing and CPG in particular. Uh, so what's different maybe about your approach to that? What makes it a smart audience as opposed to simply a, a segment? And I guess the sort of flip side of that is, is there a practical limit on that? I mean, you know, I suppose in theory uh, you could derive thousands of segments, but from a managerial standpoint, that probably isn't feasible to actually address them and, and work with you know, your partners on messaging and so forth. So how different is it uh, from traditional segmentation, and is there some kind of a natural limit on the number of segments you would want to produce? Yeah, uh, so my 30,000th view on that one is that segmentation of overall is, 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 is very useful. I think that we work at P&G with design targets for our product, and it usually goes into who is your, um, who's your consumer here, right? Um, uh, what the problem has been, from my experience, is in, you know, again, big bang launches with mass media approaches, is that we weren't always able or often not able to find the exact people. It got watered down to demographic targeting, uh, sometimes based on what the, 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 um, the usage was from the media channel that you chose, right? Um, so what this means for me is that you can actually take your segments and translate them into audiences that are actually addressable. Uh, and that is a significant step forward versus what we've always done. Addressability of individuals on an anonymous fashion with all the privacy concerns taken care of is one of the big drivers of what I would call um, waste management. Okay, good point. Uh, one last question then, uh, and it goes back to that notion of uh, how you define the segments. Early on, uh, there was a question about how do you make consumers go green, I think was the way the question was phrased, or maybe paraphrase it as, um, is Procter & Gamble in the business of sort of educating and informing consumers to make them want to prefer natural products and so forth, or do you see this more as a reaction to like pre-existing 
demands, and would you segment or define a, a, a segment by, say, its, its interest in, in natural products or concerns about you know, environment, uh, green, and that sort of thing. So uh, is it a push or a pull when it comes to kind of defining and, and communicating with a green consumer? Yeah, um, it, the balance answer is a little bit of both, although it's more that, um, uh, of course, it's, it, we are um, following the consumer quite a bit with, with trends, although it doesn't have to be the, the, the mass audience just yet. One of the things with this also is if you can find specific uh, people and you have um, production capabilities that can be running smaller batches, you can probably get in earlier with certain specialty products for specific, uh, specific niches of people. Now, I, I think the, the, the push part of this one is um, helping people, uh, or educating people of what sustainability and natural really is about, uh, because there are, um, in this space especially, I think, it, you know, it's the eye of the beholder what's declared natural or not. And um, setting a high bar and educating consumers on this is like, why, why does this matter, right? I think it's part of the brand story to stand out from others that may call, them out, may call themselves natural as well. Um, and with that, probably also the, the, the total exposure that P&G gets may lead to some other people saying, okay, I believe in natural products. I now have for, uh, you know, a good reason to believe that a natural product, you know, that, that my assumption that natural products are less uh, effective or, or don't work as well as non-natural products, that that may not be the case. That, that has always been an assumption uh, for many of the people uh, that, um, I, you know, that's where our high bar is in. It's like we, we don't believe in bringing out a product that is just substandard. It has to have a superior performance for us to put our name on it. Um, and having natural pr products with a superior performance may actually widen the interest of people to actually buy natural products. I think that's a great point about the integrity of the P&G brand, and, and uh, you can't erode that and turning it around. It has kind of an endorsement value, if you will, of the message about natural products being both effective and maybe better in some, some sense for the environment or the individual. Well, you've given us a lot to think about, Stan. I really appreciate the presentation. A number of the comments that were uh, typed in uh, said great presentation, well organized. Uh, so I, I know the audience enjoyed that. Um, I want to thank uh, you, Stan, and the audience for being with us today. Uh, we will be sending a recording of this webinar soon, so if you have additional questions about the presentation, you can also follow up with Stan at Houston, J-O-O-S-T-E-N dot S at pg.com, houston.s at pg.com. Uh, and I want to remind the audience that since 1961, nonprofit MSI has brought together the best minds in marketing from major corporations and top business schools around the world to improve business practice by applying science to marketing's biggest challenges. Thanks again, and we'll look forward to seeing you at our next Lunch and Learn webinar series.